Hello， 大家好。哎，我们即将开始下午的这个 election tech session。那这个 session 呃会用英文进行。那如果你需要那个口译的耳机的话，请呃如果你没有自备耳机的话，请赶快到三楼后面的有有卖耳机。好。Okay, we're getting started for、uh, this afternoon's election tech session. Uh, can can we have the projector? Yeah. So、uh, first of all,、uh, we will have、uh, three wonderful panelists from around the world. And、uh, joining us in this panel, and in the meantime,、uh, they will、uh, do a short presentation about the projects they're working on.、Um, so please join Slido.com and put in the、uh, date today, which is 1006 R0, which is this room.、Uh, if you have questions、um, while the speakers are, are talking, we we reserve like、uh, I guess more than half of the time for Q and A because I think this is an issue that people、uh, all care a lot about. And so. Um, let me get started.、Um, well, again, this is Slido and the room number you want in. So,、uh, everyone, I'm CL.、Uh, people call me CL Cow、uh, on the internet. I do software, and、uh, as you can see, I do software a lot, even when I'm in hospital. And this is actually the accident that led to、uh, where we started the、uh, Gov Zero community because I had nothing to do, and then I started to care about what the government was doing, <laughs> and so I started Gov Zero.、Um, so election、uh, and technology is always like my interest area. It's like it's, we are changing、uh, how democracy works, and, and election itself is a, like a very important part of that process, right? Um, so this is me thinking, and just echo the、uh, morning session on on Ethan.、Uh, <laughs> we have now nowadays I'm really busy because I have two small kids and arrest, and my record is five times、um, in the in the last four or five years. Well,、uh, well, yet、uh, fortunately no criminal charge has been brought successfully against me. And well, I also have the honour to be the first openly gay candidate in Macau's election history. And I, yeah, so I do both social activism, human rights activism, LGBT equality, and also software development. So to,、um, today I'm going to share with you、um, some votes under oppression, how tech can help solve the legal and politi、uh, political problems.、And、the votes that I'm going to talk about are. The civil referendum in Hong Kong in 2014, and also the 2014 civil referendum in Macau. And I was deeply involved in the、um, Macau civil、uh, in the Macau civil referendum,、um, and also the Macau civil referendum learned a lot from the Hong Kong civil referendum. So I know、um, the、um, a bit、uh, some technical background about the Hong Kong one, and, and, and I will explain how. Could be put to use to protect、uh, people's、uh, freedom of expression, and I guess all,、uh, many of you are also aware of a development in Spain last year about a an independence vote, and this vote, or from my view, is a embodiment of a vote under oppression. And I will talk about more about I will talk about、uh, what kinds of threats、um, this vote. Have faced and what design challenges and what design concerns、um, that we can、um, consider if,、uh, if we are asked to develop a next、um, online voting platform for votes under oppression. So now I have to、um, hand the stage. I、uh, have to yield the floor to、um, to the next speaker to introduce to give an overview of his. Okay, let's yield the floor back to Xiao Kang. Yeah, so that will be the insurrectionist part of、uh, the talk, and next we have Federico、um, from Italy. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's really exciting to be here in Taiwan. I met some of the Taiwanese community around at events in the world, and I'm now really, really happy. To be here and to learn from your experience.、Um, as, um, as it was mentioned, I come from Italy, where I manage a、uh, civil society organization called、uh, Repartir Futuro, which means、uh, uh, restarting the future. 
uh, without corruption. Um, despite being one of the richest countries in the world and uh, um, one of the most developed ones, um, Italy is part of the G7, uh, is one of the, um, I wouldn't say the most, most corrupted countries in the world, but for sure in the Western world or in the Western Europe is the most corrupted one. And corruption is really a big issue. Uh, so what we are doing is trying to mobilize people um, in order to um, to fight corruption, to build, I would say, bottom up and uh, sometimes from the top to the bottom movement in order to to fight to fight corruption. Um, in this. Um, um, last five years, um, we collected uh, uh, more than 1 million point two signatures of people uh, who are now following our activities and uh, uh, how we did it through petitions, every campaign. So uh, we started many campaigns on different issues related to transparency and uh, anti-corruption and uh, every campaign has its own petition. Um, every petition was signed by a different number of, uh, of people um, telling um, how issues are important for, uh, for, different, um, for, for Italian citizens. Um, what we achieved so far, just to give you um, a very um, quick uh, understanding on, of what um, we did in the last, in the last years, uh, uh, Riparte Futuros was launched in 2013 or at the end of 2012. Um, in uh, 2015, we um, uh, reached one million supporters and uh, the first action, I mean, the first main action was uh, um, that we convinced the uh, parliament uh, uh, to introduce a ban of the life annuities to former MEPs found guilty of mafia and corruption. I know that it can sound strange, but uh, it was like this, <laughs> that corrupted uh, politicians uh, could uh, receive uh, uh, annuities from, from the parliament. And two other campaigns that I want to uh, highlight are the Freedom of Information Act, which was introduced in Italy um, after an, uh, a long campaign uh, run by Riparte del Futuro and other civil society organizations in uh, 2016 and in 2017, the whistleblowing protection. Um, okay. Thank you, Federico, for the intro. And uh, last but not least, we have Adriana from Germany talking about the project We Public. Thank you. Hello, thanks for having me. Um, yeah, my name is Adriana. I'm based in Berlin. And since one year, I'm working for the Open Knowledge Foundation. But before I started doing that, um, a group of friends and I sat down and started the initiative we public. Um, let me quickly go back to 2016, where we had Brexit. Um, and while this happened, I studied European studies in Maastricht in the Netherlands. Uh, we went to bed, everyone believed, are we going to be fine? My colleagues uh, in university, they came from uh, Poland to Portugal, from the UK to to Italy and no one really believed it's going to happen. But the next morning, really early, we woke up, checked our phones and there it was. And it was really bad, it was really personal, all my British friends cried. So that was, that was really a, a bad experience. But then, there was Trump. <laughs> and uh, again, uh, no one really believed that it's going to happen, but I went to bed, I had a really bad feeling about the whole thing. Then I woke up the next morning again, checked my phone, first thing, and I, I don't want to quote, but the first message I saw on my phone was from a friend from the US, all capitals, sh about to hit the fan. And yeah, that, that was the reaction, the reaction to, to Trump. And then again in 2016, I graduated. And because of all of this, what happened before, um, 
going to Brussels working for some, some MEP or working for a consultancy wasn't suddenly really an option anymore. I had this urgent feeling that I need to, to do something about this whole situation. So um, that, that was the moment when uh, my friends and I, we sat down and we came up with uh, this initiative, which I'll tell you more about um, after my fellow panelists. Thank you. Thank you, Adriana. Uh, so if you're just joining us, um, we have the Slido that's taking question um, on this room. If you go to slido.com and then uh, 1006 at today's day and the room R0. So uh, we'll now uh, welcome uh, Jason for telling us a bit more about Oot. <laughs> Fingers crossed. We tested it. <laughs> yeah, OK, about the, um, the thing happening in Macau and then what can possibly be done in the future. OK, thanks, Yao Kao. Well, um, well, in, well, in Macau, we held or we organized votes, and many of the votes and most of the votes uh, did not have any legal effect. And, well, unlike in Taiwan, you had a law on referendum in which you could vote in a referendum which, well, if, if certain conditions are met, the result would have a legal effect. Yeah, but so many would challenge us. What's the point of hosting votes without a legal effect? So that's, so I, I would like to show you one of the votes that we have organized before. Mao 期间遭到网络攻击，至于官方澳门民政总署的真名活动，下个月才会正式公布。别以为猫熊叫什么名字，它本身不在意。Well, doesn't the vote, doesn't the vote, uh, look silly? Um, well, um, in places where people um, are not used to um, freedom of expression, people might repurpose such votes to express their opinion and um, this is just one of the votes that I have organized yeah but I'm not to I'm not talking about um, this panda name vote this panda nickname vote because this vote um, uh, for this vote the result is very provocative but it was not oppressed probably the, uh, the authority did not envision um, the final result and that's why it did not get oppressed so but I'm going to talk about um, the votes uh, that were subject to oppression. Let me, well, how to get to next? Okay. Okay. Um, well, as a person who uh, often travels um, between uh, the, dis the disciplines of activism and a uh, law, uh, sorry, the dis yeah. Oh, sorry, let me put it this way. As a person who has um, often traveled between the disciplines of um, activism and tech, um, I have a, a, a simple uh, observation. Um, tech people often um, overlook the legal and political aspects of their project. And likewise, people in politics are not fully aware of the potentials of tech and I hope that um, in, the, in the design of future votes, the tech community and the, and the um, activism people can work closely together so that we can discuss what, uh, well, what potential the techs might deliver and, and also the tech people should be aware um, in advance what a legal and, a political problem, and political problems that they may run into. So let's get started with um, Hong Kong's um, civil referendum. 
um, which took place uh, in June 2014. It was three months um, before the commencement of the well-known umbrella movement. But back then, the Chinese government um, presented um, some proposal that the Chinese government called universal suffrage, but it was not uh, but it was clearly not uh, universal suffrage. The Beijing had the authority to um, rule out some candidates before the candidates can be um, put to a vote by the general population. So some uh, political organizations in Hong Kong presented their proposals and they put the proposals to a vote. And the votes um, turned out that um, the Hong Kong people were in favor of proposals of genuine um, universal suffrage. And of course, the Chinese government did not like this vote. And um, this uh, well-known um, civil referendum was subject to um, a, a, a distributed denial of service attack. And that attack was at a, at a, was at a unprecedented uh, was at an unprecedented scale that even a famous um, protection provider, Cloudflare, denied the protection initially. Well, but later, after the news um, broke out, uh, Cloudflare intervened and, and provided uh, un, un, unlimited support to the University of Hong Kong public opinions programs for protection. And, and also, um, the, the organizers of the votes um, uh, suffered a problem of hacking some of the workers within the um, uh, with, within the public opinion program of the of University of Hong Kong got hacked. So 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 we can see that um, cyber attack is one of the threats that a vote under oppression might face, and the cyber attacks were well from my view clearly uh, masterminded by a state agent or a or a state actor. Okay. Okay. Now I talk about mine, and well, um, the Macau civil referendum, the Macau civil referendum took place two months after the Hong Kong's one, and Macau's emotions are different. There, well, we presented two questions. The first one is the confidence in the um, so candidate at the so-called chief executive election. And the second question was a support for universal suffrage. And well, initially, we predicted the same um, threat model as um, the Hong Kong civil referendum. So I, uh, so I set up um, very strong defense against cyber attacks. But it didn't work out because this time the, the, uh, the threat model changed. It changed from a cyber attack to a legal attack. So I got arrested. Uh, some of uh, my fellow um, volunteers and organizers got arrested. And I got an order from the public prosecutor uh, for data seizure. Well, I, well we, I, uh, I refused to comply with that order, but yeah, but that legal side of attack was what um, was something that I um, um, I did not anticipate. So, so if I were asked it to design um, a system for the next world, we have to take both the legal and technological aspects into account. Well, but well, but anyhow, both um, the Macau vote and Hong Kong vote um, were successful. We got um, the results that we could get, and the citizens enjoyed this vote, um, the opportunities brought by this vote to express their opinion. And um, the um, the vote in Catalonia last year uh, was what I say uh, uh, was uh, under multifaceted um, suppression. Um, so um, the the, uh, the Catalonia vote um, 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 got um, legal orders as that was sought to prevent the vote from happening. Well, a, a, a rest of the leaders of the um, Catalan government um, were made, and there was internet censorship, and there was denial of service. And for the purpose of um, the Catalan uh, vote. The denial of service was not um, enabled by cyber attacks, but by uh, a police raid. The police just intervened directly. 
uh, just or in, engage with the service provider directly to, de to deny services. And also, the polling stations were raided, and the um, and the ballots and uh, and the um, ballot papers were confiscated. So we can see that um, this is a, a an enhanced version of um, of of oppressing a vote. So, so I, pre I always present myself a question as a person who, um, who has kept an eye on the development of um, technology and voting. What if, uh, what if my colleagues were asked, well, what if my colleagues um, were to ask me to design a system that uh, f for a sensitive vote that would happen, um, next month, what would I do? So I summarized the threats that these votes have faced. So there are, there are four models. It can be denial of service for the Hong Kong. It was from a cyber attack from Catalonia. It was a, a shutdown of websites and suspension of domains. You ha we had police intervention, judicial order, and media censorship. So we can see that there can be these kinds of threats um, facing uh, set, vote, uh, facing these sensitive votes, and also we can we should look at uh, what are the targets of these threat models. For the night of service, the target is the infrastructure. For police intervention, the the, well, the targets are um, the hardcore voters, volunteers, and supporters, and so on and so forth. So I so I'm proposing uh, this kind of infrastructure for a voting system. And well, the important point is that we should use um, well, well, we should use the hidden web to route the um, um, well to well to route the traffic to a a um, to um, to a backend server that's out of that's, that be, that would become effectively out of the jurisdiction of the host state, and also there should be a clear separation of the roles between um, the RT people and the politicians or the activists on the, um, on the front. So that by providing this insulation, um, um, the police would have no person to look, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to look after if the police want to take the website down. And well, well, we know that um, blockchain technologies are not mature yet, but there's a um, good aspect of blockchain that we should use, which is um, the ability to store information permanently, or at least some piece of information permanently. Well, uh, we, can, we should not use the so-called distribution decision-making mechanism of blockchain, but is the, but from my view, it's desirable to put the timestamps, check some, and final result on the blockchain. So no matter um, how, um, so 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 no so no matter so no matter how um, the vote is going to get suppressed, um, the result and the proof for for the integrity will leave on the blockchain. And there's also a problem for uh, voter. Eligibility from Macau, we could use um, some check digits from uh, uh, on on the Macau identity paper to check the voters' eligibility. But there was some technical constraint that I had to open the votes to non-permanent citizens. Under usually under Macau's law, um, only citizens were. Um, allowed it to cast a ballot, but in our case, I had to open it up to also non um, non permanent residents because there was no way to technically just looking at these numbers to distinguish non -per non permanent residents and permanent residents. And uh, in Hong Kong, uh, what they were using was uh, a just a check digit at the end of their. Um, of the ID card number, and both Hong Kong and Macau used a combination of uh, ID card number check uh, combined with a, a phone number verification. So, so we could, so as civil society actors, we could only approximate the principle of one person, one vote. Um, by doing so, we can minimize the effect of fraudulent votes. And the problem of um, of voter eligibility is important. I guess you are familiar with this vote hosted by a Taiwanese um, political party. And uh, well, we knew that um, this particular mascot was elected. And I also learned from the news that some leaders of this political party did not really like this mascot. The problem was that it, 
um, the designer or the architect of the world did not envision the problem of voter eligibility. Well, I know that there are uh, very smart statisticians in Taiwan, but their knowledge did not trans. Uh, well, their knowledge was not transferred to the to the people hosting um, the mascot vote. Uh, but from the Western's eyes, but I think, um, well, the, 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 these two mascots on, well, on, uh, on this end uh, would look more controversial. I mean, yeah. So, well, to sum up, um, well, uh, well um, under the um, new design concept, I could only medicate, I, I could only um, um, mitigate some of the threats, but not all. And there are some um, issues is that, um, that that still could not be addressed, and I hope that I can discuss this problem um, at the at the discussion session. So I uh, yield the floor back to Xiao Cap. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jason, for the overview for um, like how you implement a well whole new election system, <laughs> I suppose. Um, so before we go to um, the discussion, we will continue with uh, Federico on the um, ah my laptop is weird. So, um, no, not here. Yeah. So I will tell you a little bit more about one of our projects, our campaigns, um, which is the on transparency of elections in Italy. And it was our first campaign which started for the general elections of 2013. And we are still running the same campaign at uh, in the occasion of every election at a local and a national level. Um, which is the problem, is that um, as um, today I saw a slide, Italy is uh, one of the countries where the trust in government is uh, um, uh, really decreasing um, dramatically in the last years, just 20% of the citizens trust the government and institutions. And, um, parties don't filter anymore the candidates. They just pick the ones who are able to collect votes, nothing more, independently um, that uh, um, they might have criminal records or um, that they are connected uh, to organized crime as mafia and uh, criminal organization is, uh, um, um, is an issue affecting my country. Um, so what we uh, did, we developed a digital platform where voters can check the candidates' uh, profiles. We have engaged citizens through an online petition. I told you that uh, petitions, we always use petitions, urging candidates to commit against corruption. Um, candidates from all political parties have been asked to publish online their curricula, any potential conflicts of interest by filling a form, I'll show you later, their criminal records, their annual incomes, and who finance their campaign. This is um, how the personal profile, in this case it's the deputy uh, prime minister, the leader of the um, Five Star Movements, maybe someone has heard about this um, political movement. And as you see, the CV, um, the judiciary state, uh, and then the conflict of, oh, sorry, the conflict of interest, okay. They have to fill a form on the conflict of interest the um, income situation and who financed the campaign. Um, so, uh, by starting with the campaign of the, the first one, the 2013, what was brilliant at the time was to give a, a gadget, a present to the candidates who, um, who joined the, cam the campaign, who decided to submit, uh, to publish their 
data on our platform. We sent a bracelet, uh, this is why we called the white bracelet uh, uh, campaign, we sent a bracelet that candidates could use during the elections, showing that they were committed to anti-corruption. And as you can see, there is written uh, one cento giorni, which means 100 days because uh, they pledged not just to publish their data online, but um, um, to, um, this, sorry, to amend um, the penal code once elected. So in case of election, um, they should have uh, amended the penal code, uh, in particular um, the article uh, um, which um, is related to the um, relations between politicians uh, and uh, criminal organizations. At that time, that article was completely unaffected. Um, so, um, that campaign was particularly successful because it was the first time, and at that time, I mean, uh, during the uh, 2013 election uh, campaign, uh, transparency was really the main focus for politicians. The Movimento Cinque Stelle, the Five Stars movement, uh, which was really pushing the uh, previous government for more transparency, uh, presented itself for the first time at that election, and it was really, really um, uh, presented itself as the movement for transparency. And many candidates belonging to different uh, uh, political parties uh, joined our campaign. Um, just to give you some, some number, 900 candidates uh, uh, joined the campaign and uh, among them, uh, some of them, uh, around 400 were elected and uh, among them, um, I can notice um, that there were the prime minister, the former prime minister, the president of the Senate and the president of the Chamber of Deputies, which helped a lot us in the uh, following years in order to uh, approve the laws, to amend the laws I mentioned you before at, um, in my presentation. Um, this is, uh, Psyche Voting means know your candidate. This is the um, platform that we developed. This is the team uh, with my colleagues. Uh, I'm the older one, as you can see. And um, um, this is a platform uh, um, that we uh, started in uh, uh, 2016 and we proposed uh, at the election in 2016 and 2017. It works in a similar way as the one um, I, I mentioned you before, um, but um, uh, in this case, we try to work together with uh, other NGOs to convince, to, to build a coalition of same-minded uh, uh, civil society organization trying to work together. The experiment was not that successful in the sense that the other NGOs were not that interested in um, uh, really being committed to this campaign, but I mean, it's usually a big challenge to uh, work with other organizations. And the platform allowed citizens to send direct messages to candidates via email, tweets, and Facebook. And another important uh, um, 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 what, what was important for this campaign is that we uh, provided also a toolkit which was useful for activists. Everyone could download uh, this toolkit and there were instructions in how to contact candidates, uh, how to um, build up um, a meeting with a candidate, uh, to organize a meeting with, uh, in this case, a mayor candidate. And um, this is the outcomes uh, of the two campaigns, the 2016 and the 2017 campaigns. The last campaign was called Transparent Candidates. Uh, I have to add, uh, yesterday someone uh, um, 
of the of the speakers at the, the keynote was saying that told that it's always very important to understand which is the political scenario and as in 2013 the political scenario was really in favor of transparency the main issue raised by i would say by the italian um, public opinion in 20 in the 2018 um, um, elections were mig was migration and uh, uh, transparency was not that important which means that our campaign was less successful than the one um, the, the previous one but around the 400 candidates joined the campaign um, this time we also asked them to publish the information about the campaign funding and uh, we um, pushed them um, to approve so one selected and this is an important uh, point I mean their commitment does uh, um, don't finish uh, once they are elected we are following what they are doing after the, the their election and uh, once we are in service and so we uh, we want a law on the transparency in election um, that allows citizens to know better who their candidates are. Uh, 123 candidates have been elected. Um, um, 50,000 uh, citizens signed the signature, uh, the, the petition, which is not bad, but compared to the previous one, uh, when around two. Uh, 150,000 citizens uh, um, um, signed the petition. I mean, it's, uh, it was not successful, <laughs> I would say. Um, we, we like to track what, uh, what, what we do, which means that five people uh, um, of the organization worked full time for this campaign. We campaigned for 22 days. We directly uh, contacted uh, um, seven, uh, 70, 750 uh, candidates. Um, um, I already mentioned the number of people uh, who signed the petition. Um, 11,000 uh, people uh, sent direct requests to candidates through our platform to join the campaign, which doesn't mean that people um, did not contact candidates through other uh, media, but it's, it was the first time we used such a way, and it was really interesting to understand uh, how citizens were engaged. And 1.3 million people um, watched our uh, videos because uh, as campaigners we uh, love to uh, to spread the voice and to have people on board to um, to try to mobilize uh, a great amount of people and 5.5 million people re were reached through social media this is the last slide the platform just an insight was designed to guide voters directly to their own constituency so users could search by municipality and if desired also by political party and uh, users could also report potential inconsistencies which means that we are not policemen it's a neutral platform um, we don't judge the candidates we just want candidates to be transparent um, but uh, citizens can write if there is any consistency in the declaration made by the candidates. Thank you very much. Thank you, Federico, for the story uh, on um, campaigning the transparency during the election. I think uh, we have a lot to learn from you. And so uh, now we have, please, uh, Adriana, for the We Public project in Germany. Does it work now? Okay. Um, so just to recap, Brexit, Trump, graduation. Um, 
We, we are no organization, we didn't have any organization that backed us up. We also, we were not a campaign. We uh, were literally just a group of friends that all just graduated from uh, their master's degree or was in the final years of their master's degree. And we sat down at one of our mom's kitchen table and we thought, um, okay, what, what are we doing now? And I just see that I'm missing slides here. Um, I'll try. Yeah, there are two missing. Um, I see if I. Yeah, I just use. I just you know. I just talk about beautiful Taiwan. I love it here. Um, let me quickly. Maybe I find them on the top. No, they are not there. Um, I improvise. <laughs> okay, so we, we sat down at um, one of our mom's kitchen table and we thought, okay, what is the problem? And we mainly identified three problems. Uh, one of them was that there's a deep mistrust of citizens in institutions. So in institutions are all kinds of, it can be the police, it can be the court system, it can be political parties, all kinds of traditional democratic systems are deeply um, in danger because of this mistrust. And mistrust isn't a necessarily bad thing, but if it's too much and if it's not justified, then it just kills the whole system without any real need for it. Coming back to the keynote, um, if we are inside the system or outside the system, uh, but that's another topic. So that was one thing. Another thing was, that at least in Germany, I'm not sure if this is a global trend, I know that it's a trend in many countries and for sure in Germany, uh, many younger people, people in our age, they don't join political parties anymore. They are flexible voters, sometimes they vote for one party, next election they vote for a different party. Um, it's okay. And um, this isn't that much of a problem itself, but it prevents citizens from uh, bringing, making their voice heard between elections. Because usually when you're in a, when you're in a party, um, you talk to your local office of that party. And there's a leader of that office that goes to the national level and talks to his colleagues. And that's how there's a bottom-up movement of voices um, to the national level where it gets included in decision-making. So if no one is a member of a party anymore, it's really tricky between elections to push, your, to push your voice and your opinions into the political system. Um, also, mass media used to be the predominant um, source for information. So there were a couple of big newspapers or TV channels everyone watched. So everyone had kind of the same knowledge base. And then, was, then, then there were experts for some fields. And that was all really, it was really hierarchical, but it was also really structured. Um, splitting that system up so everyone now can publish a blog online or can make their voice heard has its benefits. It also has negative aspects that who's accountable for the information that's being pushed out there. Some people want to disinform others and they now have uh, better platforms to do so because people do not read um, newspapers that are held to certain quality standards anymore. They might only read blogs that can be very good blogs, but they can also be very bad blogs. And now I think about the third point, which I cannot remember at the moment, but maybe we can only go with those two. Um, oh no, I remember. And then there's one thing, uh, we wondered why everyone uses their phone every day to text family, friends, but we also use text messages to talk to our colleagues at work. Um, we use apps for very specific purposes. We order an Uber, a taxi, we order food, we check how we get from A to B, the fastest, and, and then we sat down and we, we thought, okay, why is there no specific channel, may it be an app or a website, any digital tool, that is designed for those problems we have, those communication problems we have between citizens and politicians. Because we think the communication channel between the citizens and the representatives is broken and that makes a lot of things uh, worse because without communication there's no understanding and without understanding there's no good decision making. So we thought, okay, what can we do? We cannot, we cannot single-handedly fix the whole problem, but we can think about how do we install trust or how do we help trust to be built. 
and we thought, okay, we need transparent com communication. We need more direct communication. It needs to be open for everyone. You don't have to go to a town hall meeting. Maybe you need to work, maybe you have children, you have no time, and maybe you don't want to stand up in, in front of a group of people because it makes you feel uncomfortable. So maybe we give you a tool, a digital tool, where it's not needed to go somewhere and expose yourself. Um, and also, there are no channels or no tools designed for that purpose. Many of us use Twitter or Facebook um, to talk to politicians or to rant about what they think uh, is wrong with the poli political system. That's okay, but it's really ineffective. Uh, again, coming back to the keynote this morning, it's about efficiency. So why do you just put, put out your voice somewhere to the internet when you can maybe target who you want to target directly? Twitter might, might work, but Twitter, at least uh, in Germany and in most of the European uh, countries, is a very, let's say, elite tool. Most people are not on Twitter, just some are. So th that's not really effective. So this is like the whole background. So we thought, okay, we need to design a channel specifically aimed at understanding uh, citizens and politicians, understanding each other. And um, there was the federal election in Germany in 2017. Uh, it's like the general election for uh, the no next four years. And we uh, built an app for, for that purpose. Um, it, will call, it was called PlusMe because um, everyone who participated could cast a vote by going PlusMe. And it uh, more or less worked like this. Uh, it looked like uh, a chat and you could only ask questions, it was for the election specifically, so questions about things uh, that matter to you. And then you sent that question and everyone else who used the app could see the, that question you asked. And if they think, oh, that's a good question, then they went plus me. And, uh, or they asked uh, a different question that was important for them. And by that way, every day we had one question that was of the highest interest uh, for everyone that used that app. And this question was posted forward to all seven major, major um, political parties in Germany. By that way, we made it possible that a group of people that cares about the same question talks to a group of politicians that then answers that question. So you don't need to know if you're interested in voting for the Greens or the lefties or the Conservatives. You only need to know what you care about and you get seven different approaches to that question that you can then compare and during that process you understand maybe, okay, I really like, every time uh, I get an answer from that party, I really like it. Um, there was also, maybe I talk it quickly through it so it looked now it doesn't work anymore, there it is. It looked like this, so I'm sorry it's in German, I, I couldn't translate it. Um, so you just posted a question, uh, you send it, if someone liked it, it changed uh, the bubble from one end to the other, and then there came the answers. So it looked like a group chat where you have one question on top and then seven different little text messages underneath, and you didn't know who gave the answer until you said good answer or bad answer. By that way, we also tried to put a little gamification into it and to make it more, make it more fun, more engaging, and also to prevent you seeing, oh, this is from the left, I don't like the left, I don't like the answer. Read it first, think about it, and then after you find out. Um, so yeah, then it switched the icon so you could see. Um, it worked out really nicely. It was really nicely to see that a group with uh, no experience, like me and my friends, uh, no users, could go up to uh, the big parties in Germany and be like, okay, we have this app, it's, it's, cu it's cool, it's young, it's digital, you want to engage people, will you use it? They said yes, and, um, and it, it, it worked out um, pretty nice. But the idea is to not have something like this only for election, elections. The idea is to have something like this permanently open and accessible for both sides, politicians and the citizens, to understand what is going on on each side. So to not only allow questions, but also allow opinions or, or um, ideas to be pushed over that. So we are complete rookies. Um, we don't know what, what is doable and what is not but you get your dreams smashed anyway, so you might as well dream big. And so we thought, okay, maybe 
We make it like this many-to-many -many communication, like a huge group chat, but we use natural language processing or some, some sort of intelligent software that can cluster input from both sides, like, like in that format I put here, so that it becomes understandable for everyone who's looking up on that app what is going on, so that you don't have like this massive pile of information, you get clusters and you might be able to inter uh, to be um, yeah to interact with others, so uh, that's what we did. Um, we are now thinking about doing it for the European elections. There's a big European election coming up in 2019 in the beginning, and we hope that by by experimenting with uh, tools like this one, um, that do no they they don't they don't do any harm, but they provide lessons learned and they might help others to also try um, tools like this and in the end they might improve communication between different groups uh, in society and between politicians and citizens. So um, I'm looking forward to the discussion and I hope you have many questions. Thank you Adriana. <clears throat> So I think this is a perfect example for a theme uh, participation that uh, we just mentioned this morning. And uh, so uh, as you can see, we have a very diverse uh, use of technology uh, that um, maybe in, maybe in the, uh, the, the, the infrastructure of an election, to how, how can you design a system that is uh, for people who wants to do self-determination uh, without oppression from the certain authority. And we have um, um, a way to interact with maybe just a candidate or in future or the politician. And we have using uh, example using technology to encourage uh, transparency <coughs> um, more proactively from the politician themselves. Um, so we have, uh, whoa, what's going on? Quite a few questions. Uh, there were some questions here. It was gone or? Okay, let's try. Okay, um, so if, if you want to ask a question, you can uh, go to slido.com or you can just raise your hands right here. Do you have any, anyone from the floor with any question for the uh, panelists right now? If not, we will go on. It's too bright. Oh, over there, please. P press the button on the... My name from uh, I'm, my name is May. I'm from Taiwan, and I was a student from SOAS too. And because you're from Almond, so I just speak in Chinese. Um, 我想要知道的是，呃，因为我有一些朋友在香港，他已经不能买飞机票或者是火车票到中国去了，所以我想要知道当你在澳门做从事这些呃擦边球的抗议行为。我想要知道你们想到那个后续在您在澳门跟在中国的发展跟您家人的安全，这是身为台湾人真的比较担心你们的事情。然后现在这边祝福你们，谢谢。That uh, question was for me, yeah. And uh, so quickly summarizing one second. Okay. Um. So um. So uh. So, so I was asked about um, some safety concerns and uh, working, um, um, well, working in a place now under Chinese rule. And uh, well, I, I would say that the, uh, the civil societies in Hong Kong and Macau are getting more and more uh, difficult to work. And the Chinese regime is getting more and more oppressive. And I guess um, Taiwan, also faces the this, um, the escalation of oppression from the Chinese regime, and well, we are, we are fully aware of um, this kind of escalation, and my colleagues on the ground will um, try their best to devise um, the appropriate response to this situation, and I, 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 I would say that we cannot just apply the past model to the present situation because um, things are quite different than it was before. So there, there isn't a direct answer to it because it really is, it is really dependent on what question um, you are working with. 
there are civil societies, there are civil society actors that work with uh, more um, governmental policy issues is there are still fine, but for yeah, but for some disruptive um, people like us, we have to uh, come up with um, smarter ways to um, um, to, uh, to, uh, to do the things. And one of the things that I'm suggesting is that we uh, we have to uh, well we have to devise strategies that cannot be expected. We have to be un uh, we have to uh, be um, uh, unexpected. We have to give surprises to the regimes so that we, so so that the uh, strategy can be effective. To devise surprises, um, that I cannot talk about the surprises um, in an open setting, and but but I would say that we cannot apply um, old ways to new problems. We have to come up with new ideas and strategies to out to outsmart the regime. I think that's the a response that I can give you. Thank you, and very and thank you very much for uh, keeping an eye on the developments in Macau and Hong Kong. Thank you. I think the short qu question was that: Can you go home? <laughs> <laughs> a really good question. Um, you don't know. You're not sure. I yet. don't know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, from um, Federico and Adriana, your point of view: uh, Is there a similar thing for um, for for people hosting the Catalonia? Uh, referendums like like that as well, because I know uh, one of the leader got chased off uh, Spain, right? So Two, two seconds delay. Yeah. Okay. Ah, hello. <laughs> um, I think he he's in Brussels now, the referendum leader at the moment. I'm not completely up to date on, on that issue. Um, so what my opinion is on that topic, or what was the question exactly? Um, so when people are trying to host election or campaign that is uh, sort of being oppressed, uh, ah. do they face the same safety issue even in Europe? Mm, in, in Germany, I don't know of any example that would be comparable. I mean, there's the danger that someone's gotten, starting to spy on you um, and that the police may raid your offices or your home. I, I do actually know of, of someone um, who had that happening to him and his family. So, yeah, I think you might, it, it's, it's, it's some sort of oppression because it might scare you and it might make it harder for you to carry on with your um, tasks. It might also, though, encourage you to, to now now even harder push for what you were planning to do and it might also increase support so that was what happened in uh, in that one case in germany in in my closer circle that i know of that the police came and looked for stuff and didn't really find anything and the media was really critical about it and um, the the civil society as well and in the end it strengthened um, it strengthened the people who were targeted. It didn't. It didn't prevent them from doing something. Yeah, I, I think there's one. Um, yeah, I think there's a one thing that I can um, mention is the is a, 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 there's a strategy that's we can use is a wise use of multiple jurisdictions, a multiple use of multiple legal you. Uh, legal units. Let's say when I was doing the Macau uh, civil referendum, I fled Macau to avoid the effect of the legal order. And uh, just like um, the, uh, the former leader of Catalonia, he fled uh, Spain and um, he, well, he, uh, he was detained by the German border when he was, uh, when, when he was returning to the um, European continent. But the German court finally um, did not accept the uh, Spanish arrest warrant and allowed him free. So I think one of the strategies is to um, break the 
uh, geogra to break the geographical boundaries. I mean, we have to make a wise use of um, the legal differences in uh, different jurisdictions that we actually live in. Okay, let's go back to a bit more uh, things about election technology <laughs> rather than just safety. <laughs> right, uh, there are uh, questions specifically for Federico that uh, the audience are curious about how this campaign that more elderly people who don't use internet to join. I mean, the digital divide problem, have you solved it or are you ignoring it? Because it's like better now. <laughs> I mean the outcomes of the campaign because we started the campaign because we wanted to, as, as, as the name of our organization um, claims, we, want, we wanted to, we, 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 the name is, is related to the future and we wanted to target young people. But we re realized after a few years uh, campaigning that we uh, reached more the <laughs> elder people than the young people, which means that uh, um, in many cases um, we were not successful, first of all, because uh, we try to convince and to target young, younger people, but um, um, we could not uh, be that e effective. And uh, on the other hand, it means that uh, there is plenty of uh, elder people. I, mm, I, I can't just uh, um, talk about the Italian or the European case in general. There are a lot of uh, elder people which are very, very, um, um, which use a lot of technologies, uh, um, such as Facebook, for example, uh, social media and they are very open to um, to be useful for, they are still very interested in being useful for society. And um, so it was quite surprising to us, not because we thought that the um, 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 elder people um, were not like this, but it was surprising the, the outcome. Um, because it was easier to engage uh, old people than young people. And this raised another question, how to engage uh, young people? We try to, in some way, as you, as you see also by uh, the picture of the, um, of, the, of the team, most of our activists, I mean, people trying to mobilize citizens are very young, but um, I would say that the most engaged are not the youngest one. <laughs> Thank you. So I think that brings us maybe to Adriana's uh, We Public is for more focused on the, the younger people. The audience is interested in the scale for um, the people who's engaging in the app and also the, uh, maybe the politician, the number of politicians. And uh, so, yeah. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. So when we... Um, um, when we started to evaluate uh, the app, we saw it were mainly uh, younger voters. But I have to say, because uh, as I said before, we didn't have any financial support, we didn't have any bigger campaign or organization backing us up, it was just us sitting down. Uh, seven people we were, one backend developer, one uh, front-end and so on. Um, and we only launched um, a good three weeks before the election. And that was okay because most people only make their decisions in the last week before the election and no one gets really, like most people don't get really interested in the election until it comes very close. But it also didn't allow us to uh, gather a huge um, user base. So we had 400 active users and um, yeah, because it wasn't a single politician from each party who answered, it was the party in general. So we didn't focus on individual people, we focused on the parties, and whoever from that party was qualified to answer the question that came from the citizens, uh, that one answered the question. So we don't even know who individual politician it was. And we chose to do it in that way because there's uh, psychological proof that in discussions, 
uh, the discussion gets less emo uh, emo emotional and less aggressive if it's not targeted at one specific person. So if you make it a little less personal, people become more structural and um, ask in a different manner than if they know this is the one politician and they hate that one, so they're going to be really aggressive. So I cannot tell you how many po politicians participated. Um, I think text messages are really easy and I know lots of elderly people who do that every day, texting um, with their family. So maybe, um, yeah, maybe if, you're in, if you are up in your 70s, um, a text message is still doable depending on your device. So we believe that if we keep it really simple in this text message format, it would be possible for, for um, all age groups to uh, participate. Um, there was a follow-up on that question. It, it's, it's something about, well, will it be dead? <laughs> yeah, how do yeah. you promote your app? And Excuse me? How, how, how do you promote your app? How? Yeah, so at the moment it's not, it's not alive because we, ta we designed it for the one election in Germany and to make it uh, an app that is also working in between elections, there needs to be a lot of things uh, done that we haven't yet. So we need uh, way more sophisticated software because the voting on each other's questions only works if there's a limited time frame and a limited amount of questions, like when you, when you run up to an election. If this is open for forever and you didn't, because you didn't have time, you didn't check in the app and there are 500 questions or ideas or opinions from your fellow citizens, you won't read them all. So we need software to structure that huge amount of in, uh, input before we can make it work in between. So yeah, as I said, we want to do it for the European election because then we don't have to change as much as we, um, as we have it at the moment. But to make it a long-term, functional, sustainable product, there needs to be a lot of more work to be done. Right, so just to recap, uh, the number of users in the last election, about 400 active yeah, users? 400 active okay. users. So more downloads, but active users, active, yeah. only 400. Yeah. So I, I'm, I'm fond of this kind of interaction in dialogue, and agreeing and disagree. It's very similar to what uh, Polis is doing, that we yeah. uh, experiment with the public opinion, uh, voting on Polis, and then you get uh, people group into opinion groups, and then see how similarity is between uh, very different opinion groups. So I think this is a, a very interesting way of, uh, a, a, like if you uh, went to Pablo's session yesterday, you can see how technology and the format of discussion forum can uh, have the impact on the quality of the discussion. So I think in the meantime, we're talking about not just election, but also the communication with the politician or the, the candidates. Uh, we need to think about, like, are there new forms of communication with that and uh, also mm -hmm. from the, uh, the citizens. Right, uh, any more questions from the floor? Over there, white shirt, please. Uh, hi, I, I have a specific question for Mr. Chow. And uh, actually, I, I'm kind of interested in the uh, voting system that you propose, which is uh, a combination between uh, you know, combination of uh, the toll system with the uh, blockchain technology. And uh, can, can you tell us more about uh, how did you come up with the idea and uh, did you design the entire protocol feed and uh, What's the current situation of the system? Is it open source or something like that? Thank you. Um, the, uh, the design concept, sorry. Hello? Okay, that's right. Um, the, the, the design concept I presented just now um, was not implemented. It was the design concept um, that I um, 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 that I made to um, uh, in, a, well, in, a, in a response to an assumption that what if my colleagues um, would, uh, uh, let's say, uh, if my colleagues um, wanted to have, a, ha to have a vote which would be subject to huge oppression uh, in, a, in a, um, let's say, next month, what would be the best design for an, uh, for an electronic voting um, platform? And, well, we know that there are too few cases of successful use of blockchain. And very often, the so-called voting or um, 
consensus mechanisms of blockchain were um, um, well, 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 were not put, uh, well, were not re uh, fairly represented. I mean, there, well, there, uh, there were, uh, there had been, well, there have been too many um, positive um, visions about what how blockchain might be used. But unfortunately, the only successful use case of blockchain is just Bitcoin, and we cannot see other successful use cases, very successful use cases. But we can use um, a characteristic of Bitcoin, which is the ability to just put a message on the blockchain and, 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 the, and the message will stay there permanently. So some people might put their uh, marriage messages, um, marriage contracts onto the blockchain for others to see so that it would uh, presumably live permanently on a blockchain. So, I can, so, so what I'm proposing is to use this characteristic to publish the results and the checksum of the vote. So what I did at my um, uh, at the civil referendum I was organizing was to implement a dead man's switch. Um, so I so I I prepared myself for a scenario in which I was taken into custody while uh, the vote was about to close. So I implemented a dead man mechanism to automatically first summarize the result publish the result and erase uh, the raw data. And, and, and if I were asked to, um, well, to design a next uh, voting um, platform, I would uh, implement a, also a dead man switch to publish the result uh, to the blockchain so that no, um, so, 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 so no matter um, the well, the organizers would be taken into custody, the system would still work. Uh, I think the audience also wanted to know the status of the, um, the design. Was it ever implemented or partially implemented? Yeah. Or? It's, uh, so, uh, I forgot, sorry. Okay, I forgot to mention that um, I open sourced um, the, my um, 2014 civil referendum um, system um, on GitHub. I think you can, uh, I, um, if you check the collaborative note, I have uploaded uh, my, power, uh, my PowerPoint to my website and there's a link on the collaborative note so that you can go to the link of my, um, of my civil referendum um, repo on GitHub. That's, that system is a design concept which, had, which, uh, well, which has not been implemented, but we have, but I suggest that the civil, um, the civil tech community should have at least some preparations in mind. As a programmer or an engineer, we, ha we, have always, uh, we should always be well prepared. We should, uh, well, you cannot have a good design just uh, come out of, uh, well, which may just come out of the blue. You should have some good design concepts in your mind so that when, um, so when there's a need to have such a system, you can deliver that system as soon as possible. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, uh, just want to add a little bit of comment because uh, from my perspective, from a technical perspective, I think the hardest part is, is uh, voter registration. Like you're relying, in your example, you're relying on an ID checksum, which is like easily generated. And then there's no, I mean, you're trying to do um, an election that is uh, oppressed by the authority, but relying on the authority's identification system. Yeah. 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 So the voter eligibility part was, uh, was something that I wanted to elaborate on. So um, who can vote is a very, Political question, just like uh, just just like the uh, case that I mentioned, the Taiwanese uh, party, the, the Taiwanese political party mascot vote. Who could vote? Who could vote for a political party's mascot? And so, in the Hong Kong Macau context, still we would consider that um, those who those who are residents should have a right to vote. But unfortunately who are legally residents are determined by the state 
or by the governments. So we had to rely on the government's identity paper to determine whether or not a person would have a right to vote. And, well, uh, uh, we are very aware of the fact that there are, uh, there, there, um, the, the algorithms or the formula for the check digits are open. So, and so it's so easy to fabricate or to generate fake identity numbers. So both the, uh, so um, from what I learned from Hong Kong and we followed suit, we used a combination of ID card number plus a local mobile phone number. But I do not recommend this approach because now I don't trust the telecoms in, um, in Macau and Hong Kong anymore. But back then, they were still, in some sense, untrustworthy. Well, in the context of 2014. So we used that combination. Um, uh, we assumed that a, well, to generate fraudulent mobile phone numbers to receive a verification text message, it would involve um, very intrusive way to uh, well to, to intervene in the operation of the telecom operators. So we thought that it would be very less likely the authority would do this. Well, we cannot ensure that um, uh, we can uh, effectively check the identity paper of every voter. But what we could do is to ensure that. Uh, a fabrication of votes would be impossible or would be too hard to have a great impact on the result. So both the Macau and Hong Kong votes could uh, approximate the uh, rule of one person, one vote. Uh, we are not government bodies, so we do not legally have the authority to ch check the identity paper of the voters. And the uh, cut on the road is a different issue. Um, they got the official um, um, electoral road from the, um, from the central government, and there were some legal disputes between that. It was a registration, voter registration based system, so they had a different approach. To encourage greater participation, what I chose was to check that if you uh, hold a valid Macau um, ID card, no matter you are a permanent citizen or non-permanent citizen, I allow you to vote because I cannot determine whether or not you, uh, you are a permanent or non-permanent citizen. So, so, so some technical constraints um, um, affected how I, dis uh, how I decided or how I wrote the uh, voting rules. All right, thank you. Uh, we don't have much time left. We have quite a pile of questions now. <laughs> so can we be like really short on the, let's try to go through then as many as possible, right? So uh, to Federico and Adriana, what do you think about technology and populism in up upcoming elections in, in uh, Europe? Let's keep it on, keep it on. Frightened by next um, European elections uh, because, uh, for example, in my country, in Italy, the last general elections were won by, I would say, two um, populist parties. One, the Five Star Movements, which could be considered like a more leftist one and um, is more involved in uh, technology and. Uh, uh, transparency issues and the other one, Lega, which is a really far right one and it's more concerned um, about migration and um, it's trying together with our political parties in Europe to build up a coalition of movements uh, um, which could um, um, heavily damage the uh, architecture of the European institutions. Um, I would say that technology could uh, surely um, help um, in the way that uh, technology can, as uh, the case of our campaigns and the case of uh, the one uh, run by Adriana, can rebuild a communication between uh, politicians uh, and uh, um, and voters uh, and can make 
take uh, pressure on politicians directly from, from, from the voters so, or can uh, express, better express the issues which are important uh, um, uh, to um, voters, uh, to, um, um, to politicians or to candidates. But there is also a dark side. There is also a dark side which is uh, fake news, uh, which is uh, eco chambers, uh, uh, which is the misuse of, uh, of technology. So I'm a technology optimist. But on the other hand, uh, we have to, we, in some way, we have to be scared by the misuse of technology or how technology can be used in a very uh, bad, uh, um, bad way. I mean, we, we have Steve Bannon now in Europe um, after he kind of failed to uh, remain Trump's little helper. He's now in Europe um, forming the movement. So yeah, the European election is going to be um, exciting. And um, I hope that civil society, I'm a helpless believer in the better argument, will find ways to push the better arguments forward. And I think tech tools can definitely help to do that. Yeah, I think that's the point for the civic tech community to work together and then because we're not just like criticizing the use of technology, but we're trying to build new ones. That's um, with democracy in, in, in the spirit in it, right? Uh, we are really out of time. So if there is any uh, question on the list you particularly want to answer, everyone can pick one, ans one to answer, okay? All right? Uh, can we have the projection? Yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm not qualified to answer um, <laughs> Asian-specific question um, about if there are funding sources available, laws about funding sources. I don't even know that for Europe, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, I, can, I can answer this one. I'm not regarding Asia, I know that. I'm, I'm, there are uh, plenty of platforms uh, around the world and plenty of uh, countries which are which have um, which made mandatory to publish the um, amount of money received in the funding the campaign fundings but for example the uk model is really really brilliant because of course there are gaps as in all the yeah, legislation but it's really brilliant because it's not just the transparency of the campaign funding but it's uh, the transparency of the amount uh, of money raised by politicians even during their mandate it's not just for uh, campaign um, okay there's a question for me um, so um, we're hosting a vote for China um, it's not a technical it's not just a technical problem or a legal problem um, so when we were organizing the vote, we had a sufficient time and space to m to make our votes known to the gen uh, to the population in Hong Kong and Macau in general. Our our uh, our votes uh, were widely reported in the news media, and most most residents were aware of the vote. And that's one of the decisive factors of the. Uh, is, is a one of the decisive factors that might determine the credibility of the vote. Well, uh, if, uh, if too few people knew about the vote, a vote would be meaningless and thus incredible. So to, to me, the, um, the ability to make the vote known to the population is important. And there's another question about uh, a trusted party for auditing um, um, civil society votes. Yes, um, I totally agree with this uh, proposition, and and let's see what we can collaborate because I can foresee that there might be some other sensitive votes or votes that might be subject to oppression. So it would be great to have a more international collaboration on a trusted audit organisation for civil society votes. Uh, I just saw someone thanking us on Slido for our efforts, and I really appreciate that, so thank you as well. All right, so uh, time's up. So everyone, one sentence for like, what election tech is to you and uh, what you want to do next year. 
a, a free and fair election and civil so the civil society work is uh, is becoming more an interdisciplinary 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 thing, and so we need a collaboration of people from different disciplines and backgrounds and people from different um, well people of uh, uh, well people of, uh, with different expertise should have exchange more often. To build coalitions, uh, working together, different uh, um, backgrounds, uh, or uh, same-minded people, or same-minded organizations. Um, in many cases, it's not a matter of um, the topics uh, we are focusing in, it's a matter of uh, defending democracy, like uh, in Europe where we um, uh, foresee an erosion of um, democracy. Uh, yeah, for me, election tech um, means tools that help both citizens and politicians to make better decisions. They need to work for both sides, otherwise the whole idea of democracy doesn't really work. We are, it's not us against them. For me, it's like, okay, how, do, how can we work together and make this whole thing work out better? All right, thank you, fellow panelists, and thank you all for being here. And then hopefully uh, next month's election in Taiwan will be interesting. <laughs> and, uh, Thank you. So uh, I think we have um, tea break at the uh, fourth floor, maybe. So yeah, thank you all very much.